The 20th century um, architectural historian Pefsner, uh, Nicholas Pefsner, um, had a book, very influential book, titled uh, Pioneers of Modern Movement from uh, from William Morris to Walter Gropius. So he started with the, he started his narrative on modern movement in architecture with William Morris. William Morris um, created the so-called arts and crafts movement. And uh, the arts and crafts movement continued many of the previous ideas initiated by Pugin and Ruskin in the celebration of Middle Ages as the ideal society with its architecture as an integrated part. And he collaborate, collaborated with um, the architect Philip Webb um, for the building of the, the Red House, um, you know, his own residence. The Red House represent um, the ideal of the arts and crafts movement. It was meant to uh, use kind of polychrome masonry, create an architecture that was meant to reflect the, the architecture of the medieval. And um, so instead of following those great cathedral, he was reviving the kind of vernacular or the folk architecture from the Middle Ages. Um, <clears throat> he used brick and um, he, um, they were meant to have honest expression of material, right? So that, that concept. So material construction needs to be honest. Um, in another word, you shouldn't paint uh, on the surface of stone and brick natural color needs to be um, what it is uh, when the building is completed. And I think this is still pretty much part of our own, uh, you know, moral uh, kind of code for uh, contemporary design uh, in our studio, right? So a lot of these eventually became part of our profession, uh, eventually became part of our uh, current 21st century uh, principle in architectural design. Uh, so honest expression of material and technique is one of them. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so, but in the art and crafts movement, there was also a anti kind of industrial gesture. I call it a gesture because it can only be a gesture. Uh, there is a gesture uh, not to to, to allow machine to corrupt the art and crafts. Uh, the building is asymmetrical, it's not standardized. Um, it used material that were not um, produced by machine. Um, and uh, so, all, so on and so forth, from interior to exterior. So you use wood, brick, glass, um, but uh, uh, didn't use metal here. And uh, um, all the furniture, everything was claimed to be handmade, not machine made. And there were very often some kind of accidental um, detail that looks you know, uh, quite spontaneous uh, like here. In those this little detail <laughs> and um, <clears throat> there was a certain also a certain degree of orientalism the windows had a strong sense of oriental taste uh, like those in japanese or chinese architecture and uh, <clears throat> so it was a mixture right it was a mixture combined with the new idea of uh, art and crafts movement and William Morris um, created a company uh, who produced those handicrafts that were uh, meant to be produced by hand. 
Um, but this idea was not, not practical because now living in a industrial society, uh, their products were very expensive. Um, and if the, you know, if the truly, um, you know, employ uh, their philosophy, uh, not using any machine at all. Um, and indeed their products were only affordable for the, um, by the uh, uh, aristocrats, uh, the common people, um, the harmonious society they were meant to create, um, the majority from that society were not able to um, buy their product at all. But they produce all kind of architecturally related uh, materials from wallpaper uh, to furniture and, uh, you know, to those, you know, chairs, bed, uh, etc. So, but uh, it kind of uh, uh, made loudly that principle, uh, you know, honesty uh, in material in construction. Um, on the other hand, those architecture employ industrial product uh, were not considered architecture at the time. Uh, the great example on that aspect include the so-called crystal palace uh, that was meant to house the great exhibition, which is the very first of its kind in 1851 to exhibit the works of industrial uh, product from all nations. And it was uh, in the Hyde Park in London. And it was meant to be constructed quickly and to be dismantled after the exhibition, right? So this is the first World Expo. Um, the committee produce their own design, which um, eventually was proved uh, unpractical. So this is their, their, their design. It used the traditional material uh, of um, 170 million bricks. Uh, you know, the, this, the, it will take just um, a more time to demolish it than to, to build it. Uh, and it cannot meet the deadline. So finally, it was a gardener saved the day, Joseph Paxton, who was not con considered an architect at all. He just built the, um, the warm house, uh, <clears throat> the conservatory, um, for the royal plantation. Um, and uh, so he made his design in just 10 days and the construction only took a few months, only took nine months from the design to the construction. The construction, actually the most time of those nine months was the prepare um, of the, the material uh, in the factory. The actual construction took only a few months so what he proposed is a building of glass and cast iron, just like the way he built a greenhouse. Um, so it was enormous. It was standardized, both the design, the construction, and the material preparation utilize the industrial process. One third of England's glass produ production at the time uh, was used for the Crystal Palace and he used modules for the building. So um, it was, it can be um, mass produced in the factory, shipped to the place and uh, constructed uh, during a very short period of time. So this kind of industrialization of the construction process um, by seamless coordination of product and assembly in place and time to achieve this great efficiency 
and great scale. There were uh, 6,000 iron columns um, hollowed to provide drainage. So there was also an innovative combination of functionality with the material, uh, load bearing material. A column is cast and after 18 hours, it is in place, it was installed. And this is also facilitated by the new kind of railroad uh, of the 19th century. So the Crystal Palace by Joseph Paxton, though it is not considered, it was not considered architecture at the time, it, it uh, used uh, exactly the way architecture is being, being constructed today. Um, and that was in 1851. So um, the way those glass plates were installed um, use those wagons that glide along the, um, the iron frame and um, you know, for the mass production. So finally, the interior was unprecedented. Uh, it created a bright interior, endless um, space, seemingly endless space, um, and uh, uh, enormous. Um, at the same time, um, it was you know it was not dark. It was not uh, humid. It has um, it created a, a a new space that nobody had had witnessed uh, before. Um, these are the contemporary illustrations um, of the Great Expo that shows those product um, on exhibition in the Crystal Palace um, in 1851. So, um, so a building like this challenged the concept of traditional concept of architecture versus engineering. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> what is architecture? If this is not, archi not, not architecture, then what is architecture? What is engineering? Um, what is the border between architecture and engineering, right? So, um, so this is still something that, you know, Northeastern University, um, the, especially the School of Architecture is meant to, to, to demolish these kind of artificial boundaries, um, you know, create a comprehensive profession that look at the built environment comprehensively. Um, but at the time, uh, you know, I'm not going to read these, um, you can read on your own. Um, the comments from the intellectuals were predominantly negative. They all criticize it, they call it is not decent, it's, it is not architecture, you know, it is, um, it might be new, but this is not a design of a taste. Um, this is not architecture. Um, only the, ti the Times um, have some positive comments on it. The, indeed, those negative comments reflect the taste of the product being exhibited in this innovative building. The product being exhibited inside are you know, using new material, use metal, but mimicking old decoration. So this is a predominant taste of the time in art and architecture. And here is a new building to shelter them. So the contradiction and uh, the tension created between architecture and art taste is most dramatically displayed um, in this in image like this. Um, there are architect um, that who were meant to bring the new material to architectural taste, kind of compromise these two extremes. Henry Labrust. Um, was one of those archi architect who were using the new material of cast iron, but give them kind of um, historical uh, or you know those a form of taste. Uh, 
those aesthetic treatment that were considered aesthetic at the time. So his um, <clears throat> library, the National Library, um, Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve in Paris uh, was a building like that. So this is the interior and uh, it is um, right next to Pantheon, right? So that's the Bibliothèque. This is the um, Pantheon. Um, Labrouste's design stand right um, next to the 18th century uh, church. So the exterior um, shows kind of a Roman, a, a Roman Renaissance kind of revival style using those arcade and dividing it horizontally, div define a base, a upper level, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and it also um, had something that is directly related to Boston because Boston Public li Library is basically a copy of this building, including those names on the wall, those great um, philosophers, those great um, writers, um, in the world history, their names were, were inscribed on the wall and uh, Boston Library is exactly like that. Um, and he also used classical reference. Um, the columns were meant to refer to the Athenian Academy reflecting the idealization of the classical Greek culture. And the use of barrel vault uh, to create a a large a space and the light weight due to the use of metal supporting skeleton uh, allows the opening of large window to illuminate the interior. So that those were unprecedented. Uh, it has a very bright interior, um, but then everything was uh, given a classical form. And um, those industrial parts were carefully hidden, um, like the metal bar tying those cast iron arch from interior that were tied to the interior, exterior of the wall were uh, covered with metal disc and those metal, metal disc mimic those classical detail, right? So those were covered here and, but they were kind of a, uh, stabilizing uh, those metal arches from the interior. So it's, it used industrial product, but those, um, just like what Gideon said, uh, those structure and engineering were used, but at the same time feared uh, and, and was covered by what were considered as those architectural treatment. Um, and in France as well, those engineering work without those architectural treatment were considered uh, not architectural. Uh, Gustav Eiffel, the famous Eiffel, um, the designer for the Eiffel Tower, now a symbol of Paris. Previously, he was an engineer. He, was, he would be called an engineer. He would, would not be um, admitted to the architectural academy, for example. So he designed bridges. Uh, he, he designed bridges like that. And uh, eventually, something like this would be celebrated in the 20th century as the great master of, uh, of architecture, uh, celebration of noble savage um, or engineer as a noble savage. Um, and eventually the, their innovation would become the backbone of modern movement. Um, <clears throat> And uh, if you read Le Corbusier's toward modern, toward a new architecture, you will read all these kind of uh, uh, 
phrases um, that proclaiming architecture as a machine for living and engineer is reaching the perfection like the classical um, Pantheon um, or Parthenon, etc., and etc. Right, but this is the um, aftermath of this creation. At the time of its creation, they were not celebrated. They were very low key, and they were considered as purely utilitarian. But in fact, someone like Gustav Eiffel was returning to the true architectural concept of the classical age because. For Vitruvius, architecture include the temple, but it also include military work, include weapon. Uh, our archi ar architect also design a uh, clock. Um, so it, it is much more comprehensive, right? So to some extent, this contrast and the struggle tension between architecture and engineering was a product of the Renaissance because the true classical age architecture was not separated from engineering uh, at all. So um, there was also a commercial aspect um, of the beginning of modern movement, new market, and uh, Gustav Eiffel designed a lot of those shelters that would cover entire street um, under under a glass roof um, so that those commercial life could, could be conducted wet or dry. And his most famous building, of course, is the um, Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower, like the Crystal Palace, was a display of industrial industrialization. Here it used just cast iron, right? Cast iron is the, the main material. Um, the construction has a speed, <clears throat> has efficiency, and um, it was also constructed for the World Expo to celebrate the, um, the uh, centennial, the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. It was meant to be a symbol um, for that, for that uh, remembrance. Um, however, unlike the, um, the British example here, um, there is no one part standardized. Uh, while Crystal Palace was using uh, very standardized um, parts, here, all can be manufactured in factory, but um, those different parts are not identical. As many as 3,629 drawings were created because of the shape. Um, it's not a straight shape, all right? It has curve. So all those need to be um, custom made. So it's, it, the design, there was a lot of design work. Um, they were made in the factory, um, but they were not standardized. Um, the Eiffel Tower also started another kind of new norm for modern architecture, that is the reach to height, facilitated by elevators. So this is one of the earliest architecture, <clears throat> employing um, elevator so that people can rise to the top to get a panoramic view of the city. And um, um, <clears throat> although, you know, that if you look at the top, you realize the top was meant to bring the engineer work to architectural taste. It looks like a Renaissance stone on a, um, on a lantern pavilion. But compared to um, the general scale of the building, um, that was you know, not nearly um, as noticeable as the, the kind of a um, cast iron skeleton. Um, like the Crystal Palace, 
the immediate reaction to the Eiffel Tower was predominantly negative, right? Intellectuals actually protest uh, against the building. And uh, people, you know, the famous um, novelist, uh, Victor Hugo commented, you know, there is only one place to get a beautiful pi picture after the construction of Eiffel Tower, and that is under Eiffel Tower, because that's the only place you won't see Eiffel Tower. Um, so he said, it's, it's ugly, it's totally ruined the city of Paris. Um, but of course, now we have a totally different view, because Eiffel Tower was celebrated by modernist in the 20th century by people like Le Corbusier, like Mies van der Rohe, like Walter Gropius um, as the great kind of modern monument. It's dynamic, it's <clears throat> truly three-dimensional, it's porous, it's dematerializing, and uh, it's also permeated by light and air. So it's all good. Um, and then there were new structural um, structural system, like the suspension uh, load bearing structure, originated uh, in bridge build building. Again, not architecture, but engineering work. John Rebling designed the uh, Brooklyn um, Bridge in New York. And uh, he used this kind of a, uh, the load were bared from those suspen suspensive um, iron cable, right? So this is a totally new way of supporting a load. And very quickly, a roof would be supported in that way and create those unprecedented uh, large span. So, here, uh, Rebling made further claim to connect material advancement with higher spirituality. So he was more conscious compared to Paxton, for example, uh, in terms of self-consciously creating a engineering work that is, that is not only material, but also spiritual. So he knew the potential of things like this for future architectural profession. And he was very conscious about that. The, the, the last topic for the 19th century architecture is the beginning of skyscraper. Uh, skyscraper facilitated by the new invention of elevator in the 19th century became possible. So early sky, uh, skyscrapers uh, were created in Chicago. So Chicago is the birthplace of skyscraper because of the uh, great fire and then the, the prosperity of commercial life and the lack of land. So, um, you know, going into sky is the um, solution for the rising uh, kind of a, a real estate a price, uh, the land price, the land expense. The uh, Monadnock uh, building in Chicago, um, kind of a, it's an interesting, it, it reflects the contradiction of the time. It has a Northern and Southern part. The Northern part, is very uh, clean without decoration. The southern part is full of uh, decoration, very classical. But um, interestingly, the northern part is a pure stone, a, a pure brick structure. And the southern part, which looks classical, which looks old, using a lot of, a lot of traditional detail, use steel frame. So there is a, a industrial material sheltered behind a classical image. And then there's a traditional material creating a clean 
um, clean facade without much ornamentation. And uh, to some extent, it, it has symbolized the, um, the struggle on the two extremes um, in terms of the definition of architecture, in terms of the de definition of taste, in terms of the relationship between engineer, structure, and architectural design. But in general, it is in Chicago that the image, proper image for modern skyscraper was created. Um, the uh, Reliance building by um, Burnham and uh, Atwood uh, created the classic image of a modern skyscraper that is very clean. It used uh, metal to create the frame structure and the surface was clad with terracotta surface that without much uh, decoration. However, it defined a lower base. The, the lower two or three story were, were uh, taller than the upper floors and were defined as the base. And then the upper floors were um, very standardized. Um, and then um, the top create a finale. So this kind of tripartite division um, eventually would become the a classic image of early skyscrapers. And you find it in Chicago, in New York, in every um, American city. So um, the window became known as the Chicago window, kind of a simplified, um, a simplified palladio motif, you know, a central large plane and a side narrow window. Um, and then it was repeated to cover a whole floor and at the whole surface, right? Um, so this is the first um, kind of a curtain wall, right? You, you have the skeleton metal, and then now the wall is just hanging there. Uh, it's not load bearing. It is hanging on the metal frame. Um, so such, uh, when skyscrapers in New York was constructed the uh, in the, late 19th century and early 20th century, more classical decoration was, was adopted uh, usually. So um, it lacked the, the um, kind of a, the cleanness of those Chicago one uh, that although, you know, compared to the current standard, there are plenty of detail and decoration that what we might call decoration, but compared to the New York, you know, there are, um, there are direct quote of those classical colonnade um, and, uh, you know, cornice um, and uh, classical decoration. But this is the beginning of skyscraper and um, it would be the 20th century that would continue this tendency and eventually created something that would become known as the modern style, which will be the topic for the, our last next uh, lecture on next Tuesday.